My name is Carolina and I am here at the very beautiful Purple Valley, which is uh, at the moment flooded by uh, quite extreme weather conditions. Uh, as you can see, there's quite a lot of rain behind us, quite a lot of winds. I hope that the sounds will not be disturbing us too much. Today, when I'm going to have the first interview of the season with Ellen Johannesson. And uh, Ellen is here at Purple Valley for the first time as a teacher. Uh, but she has been here as a student, I think it was 16 years ago. Yeah, something like that. When uh, John Scott was hosting, if I'm not completely wrong, the first retreat mm -hmm. at Purple Valley together with oh, Lucy. Yeah. 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 So it has changed a little bit. Mm -hmm. so. so Ellen, tell us a little bit about your story. About my story? Yeah. I guess you want to know about my Ashtanga story. Yeah, and a little <laughs> bit, you know, what happened in your life before you came to Ashtanga. Yeah. I know that you have been a dancer as well. Right, yeah. so I started out as a dancer. I actually had two very different dance educations. Mm -hmm. I had an education in contemporary dance, which was ballet and contemporary techniques. Very, quite rigid and, and strict education, actually, with an emphasis on uh, aesthetics. Then I moved to Amsterdam and I had a much more experimental uh, education which uh, focused on movement and movement research, the connection between mind and body and uh, uh, creativity. So it was very emphasized, it was a big emphasis on creating your own genuine material and to be able to, to perform it. So I think that has really influenced the way I'm teaching and also my preferences in, in teaching. So it was also through dance that I came into yoga. I was actually in New York in 1994 and that was, that was the time when yoga was kind of exploding in, in New York. Nobody knew about it in, uh, in Europe, it was still not so hip. Uh, but anyway, I was convinced to go to Jiva Mukti with a, with a colleague so, and I loved it. From the, from the first moment. It was uh, challenging, it was, uh, it was very artistic, it was very devotional, it had music, it had movement. Uh, I was just, uh, I was just uh, completely taken by it. Mm -hmm. So since then it, uh, since then it was yoga and it was nothing much happening in the Ashtanga scene in Norway. So I started teaching my colleagues, my dance colleagues and some actor colleagues. And um, then we had the first like, Ashtanga community. So, uh, did you come in? Did you come in contact with Ashtanga while you were in New York? Because you said that you started with the Jiva Mukti class. Yes, yeah, but they were actually teaching Ashtanga at that time. That was the last class I did before I left. Was a lead primary series, and I think I almost died. And uh, it was David Live teaching it, and he said to us all at the end, he said, "You all survived." And <laughs> then I got the little sheet and I, I memorized it. It's quite easy for dancers to, to memorize the Ashtanga sequence. And uh, I started teaching it. So I thought this is something I can remember quite easily. So this is a set sequence, what a relief. So I'm just gonna do this. So then you went back to Norway mm -hmm. and you started to teach Ashtanga. Would you say that you were one of the first teachers in Norway that yeah, brought I the practice? Yeah, I yeah. was one of, the, uh, one of the first teachers, yeah. And we also, uh, uh, a few years later, I also opened the, the first Ashtanga studio that was completely dedicated to Ashtanga and that was giving uh, Mysore morning classes. And when was that? In oh. Norway? No, not when, where? where? Oh, where? This yeah. was in Oslo. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And is that studio still there? That studio is not still there, no. but we, we kept going. I mean, I left, I started traveling to India and uh, I was really there, so... Uh, and then, of course, the scene exploded in Norway, so there were so many other studios as well. So that doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> uh, you said that... Uh, did you leave your dancing career? Well, I, did, um, I did both dancing and, and yoga for, uh, simultaneously for several years. So uh, teaching Ashtanga was kind of my regular job, my steady income. And then, of course, dancing was project to project. So it was very good to have something that was, uh, that was a steady job in between uh, projects. So I kept both going for quite some time. And uh, you also mentioned that the dancing, which was of course a big part in your life, mm -hmm. uh, influenced the way that you are teaching Ashtanga. Yeah. And in which way would you say that it is <laughs> Well, actually, uh, when I went to this uh, experimental school in, uh, in Holland, the School for New Dance Development, 
I thought it was a bit, um, it was a bit far out. It was a bit hippie. It was a bit indulgent, kind of, because it was all this like body mind centering and going deep inside and exploring things. I wasn't that fond of it at the time, but it all came back when I started teaching uh, Ashtanga. You know, the logic, the head tail connection, the center extremity connections. All the stuff we had been exploring in dance school really became handy when I when I started teaching. So that was kind of my focus, and it has been my focus, as opposed to the aesthetics of it. So I'm not so concerned with uh, with the aesthetics, but more with the uh, with the functionality and the whole like experience of uh, doing the asana practice. Okay, so can you give some examples, basically, you know how how it is, uh, uh, how you can notice that in your teaching, basically. <laughs> You can notice uh, uh, what I'm talking about. Like I will, I will talk about like um, getting the connections between different body parts. Like always keep the, always keep the heels and the sit bones in the in the relationship. So rather than, you know, if you ask a question like what is a straight knee, what is a straight arm, it's more of a relationship than a line actually. So it's not, the, it's not the, about the aesthetics. It's about how your weight is falling. So you want to work functionally. You don't want to like hyperextend or even if it might look good, you want to stay connected. And that will look different for everybody because we're all created differently. Yeah, yeah, interesting. So uh, then you brought the yoga with you from New York mm. to Norway. You opened mm -hmm. up the first studio and you started to travel to India. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what made you go to India for the first time? Well, I was very taken by India uh, the first time and I was also very afraid to go because I thought India is far away and it's a different culture and it's chaotic. So um, I hesitated for some years and then in 97 I finally went to, to Guruji. Uh, and it was it was quite like I expected, you know, people tried to kidnap me from the airport and play tricks <laughs> on me and have me pay money and stuff. Uh, I was stepping over people, sleeping in the train station, so it was just what I expected. So I thought, okay, this is how they do it here. But then I came to love India so much because it reminded me of a childhood, of spending summers on the farm, there were cows in the street. And uh, people were very like down to earth, very, very open the way the, the way people meet you. So I really loved it. But uh, what I really loved the most on my first trip was actually the yoga philosophy. That deeply resonated with me. This the whole like the concept of uh, of karma, of uh, taking the consequences of your actions, the whole investigation of the mind. That's what I had really been missing. And were they, was this being taught at the institute at that no, time? No, this was uh, this was taught by a, a separate teacher. So we went to um, uh, we went to this uh, Brahmin like three times a week, and we studied. Uh, there was a whole group of us, so we studied uh, um, pranayama and we studied the uh, yoga sutras. Mm, interesting. So speaking about the yoga philosophy then, mm -hmm. or philosophy in general, so you're men mm -hmm. mentioning that you got uh, very interested mm -hmm. in the teachings of philosophy. And you also teach a lot of beautiful philosophy in your mm -hmm. classes that I had the opportunity to join, mm -hmm. though unfortunately not all of them because mm -hmm. of the weather conditions and the work. Mm -hmm. uh, but the philosophy that you are teaching today is not only yoga philosophy, mm -hmm. it is as well Buddhist philosophy. And is this also something that you came in contact with when you were in India? Yeah, yeah. yeah. everything happens in India. India has so. been a big yeah. influence. So it was actually during my stay in Mysore that I, I came in contact with some of the students who were also practicing Buddhists. And they brought me to uh, uh, Balakuppa, to uh, Sera Monastery, and uh, the kind of the, there's a big Tibetan settlement there. So I met some of their teachers and they also started uh, teaching me. So, uh, so that's, that's how I came into, uh, into Buddhism really. Uh, because I, whereas I was very fascinated with the yoga philosophy, I didn't really find it very applicable to my own life. Whereas within Buddhism there are so many methods for really uh, changing your mind and uh, changing your perspective of the world and, and really implement that through, uh, we say, through study, contemplation and meditation. 
So I understood more how to, to implement the philosophy. <laughs> and, um, and as my, one of my teachers says, yoga is yoga. There is Buddhist yoga and there is uh, Hindu yoga. But it's all yoga. It's all about uh, using methods to gain insight because we, we can't understand reality or we can't understand who we are or what we are with our ordinary uh, consciousness because all we see is only our own concepts. So we have to develop what we call yogic perception. And that is only, we can only do that through a gradual development. We can only do that through practice. So that's kind of the gist of yoga, whether it's Buddhist or Hindu yoga, that it's a gradual path where you gain more and more insight as you do it. Mm -hmm. So, so why did you feel that uh, yoga philosophy was difficult to apply in, in real life? Because I didn't see much of a method. You can understand it intellectually, mm -hmm. right? When you read about the samskaras and all the states and the stages of the, the different uh, samadhis. Uh, uh, where, but in, in Buddhism I found really the very practical methods to, uh, to apply this, how to practice shamatha, calm abiding uh, meditation for instance, how to practice loving kindness meditation to, so to develop these uh, specific uh, qualities in yourself and to also change your outlook on the world. So it's very, very practical. Yeah, yeah. So now when you are teaching yoga, mm -hmm. when you are teaching Ashtanga, and also when you are teaching Buddhism. Basically, what are you trying to... What is your message in the Buddhism teaching? Mm. So, first of all, I, I like to teach the two together. Because, uh, like I said, um, to get yogic, to gain wisdom or yogic insight is a gradual development, right? It's just like Patanjali says, the eight limbs of, uh, of yoga. So I think it's a, it's a pity if we, if we do all this uh, physical practice and we kind of develop um, some subtle perception, some perception of our, our subtle bodies, that could be the beginning of a deeper insight. But then we might just stay with that, you know, mm -hmm. we might just stay with, uh, stay being very satisfied with uh, how great our bodies feel and uh, how great our practice is and we might be uh, very, um, we might get very into the physical part of, uh, of yoga and that's fine but I think we should also use it for something I think we should also um, apply the other steps of, uh, of yoga and there is no difference whether you follow the the Buddhist path or, or any other path yes so basically the only difference mm -hmm. is that you are teaching the Ashtanga system mm -hmm. when it comes to the physical practice and mm -hmm. then you are teaching the philosophy of Buddhism yeah, yeah. but it's the same it's the you same. know it's the it's the pratyahara, it's the dharana, dhyana and samadhi. This is very uh, detailed, this is explained in, in great detail within the Buddhist practices, how do you develop these stages. Yeah, well I have been finding your uh, Buddhist teaching uh, extremely interesting. It's been uh, very rewarding to join the classes, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but eventually you moved from the monastery in India mm -hmm. and you ended up in Nepal where you are still uh, residing now and where you're yeah. also teaching yoga and where mm -hmm. you have also been deepening your own studies both mm -hmm. of Buddhism and the Tibetan language. Mm -hmm. It's quite interesting. So can you tell us a little bit about the life that you are living in Nepal? Yeah. Uh, well, I moved to Nepal in order to uh, uh, study yeah, Tibetan language and, uh, and Buddhism. So I found that there was a very good university there and also a huge exile community of Tibetans. So I was able to live in the kind of community that I love, a community of practitioners, which of course we had in the monastery, but it's also like that in, in Nepal, in the, part of, in the Tibetan part of uh, Kathmandu where I live. So I, I find it really soothing and amazing and inspiring to, to live among other practitioners, to wake up to the sound of puja, to live within this feeling that there's always someone practicing and knowing that these people, they're always practicing for the benefit of us all, to help all sentient beings. And that is really their aim. There's of, of course a lot of chaotic things and a lot of other stuff going on in Nepal as well, but they have this incredible faith and, and devotion that I find very inspiring. So anyway, I came there to do more um, uh, organized studies. It wasn't that easy to, uh, to learn Tibetan or to, to get my head around the, 
um, the practices and philosophies that they were doing in the monastery. They were very advanced tantric practices and I didn't understand much. So I wanted to start from, uh, from scratch by learning the language so I could uh, read the scriptures myself and also talk directly to the lamas. And the philosophy is also so embedded in the language, just as it is in, uh, in Sanskrit. If you, if you study Sanskrit, it's very, yeah, it's very embedded in the language. So I moved there to actually join uh, university. So one thing led to another, a bachelor degree led to a master degree. And in, in uh, Tibetan language? Or yeah, in, in Tibetan language and then in translation. Actually, I became interested in translating Buddhist texts into, into English. Because it's also a nice work, it gives you the opportunity to... It's a teamwork. You have to sit and talk to a, to a scholar, to a Tibetan native scholar, a monk or a, or a Kempo. So you have to have them explain, you have to communicate and then you try your best to, uh, to understand. So I like that, uh, that way of working and uh, I like to dig into the texts and like uncover new territories. So we of course we translate texts that has not been translated before. Wow. Mm -hmm. So your knowledge within the Buddhist philosophy must be huge. I mean it must be really vast. Yeah, but the, the, the feel is so vast, so it's a little drop in the ocean. Yeah, maybe. yeah, yeah. But I mean, but the the Buddhist teaching that we have been receiving mm -hmm. from you here must just be like a real scratch mm -hmm. on the surface. From yeah, and and trying to cover the the general things, yes. and then of course it's there the. Um, the body of, uh, of scriptures and philosophies and different directions is enormous. It's one of the biggest uh, textual traditions I think there is. So are you teaching uh, Buddhism more in depth on any of your retreats where you basically go a little bit deeper? And um, in the knowledge that's of Buddhism? just really a matter of time, yeah. uh, you know, if you have, uh, if you have time to, to do it. So I haven't, uh, I haven't tried to do that yet. I'm mostly teaching a week or 10 mm -hmm. days retreat, so it's a limited time. And it also takes people time to, to digest, mm -hmm. because learning Buddhism is about turning your uh, head around and see the world like <laughs> completely upside down from a different perspective. And it's very counterintuitive. So you have to kind of hear it again and again and, and contemplate it. So it, it just takes time. I just know from my own study that I, I had to hear these things uh, again and again. And, and it took time for them to seep in and for, uh, to affect my, the way I was thinking, yes. really. Yes, yeah, I could mm. feel that on the classes because we are so used to listening <laughs> to the yoga philosophy. Yeah, so yeah. Hear it from a different perspective mm. was, of course, differently. Mm. A different experience, yeah. Mm. Um, except for... You also teach a Mysore program in yes. Nepal, which is actually mm -hmm. quite interesting because that's in a very specific setting, isn't it? Yeah, well, I was actually offered a, a yoga studio in Nepal. It's in a, it's in a very nice boutique hotel. Yes. But I, f I, I find that the studio is uh, created with a lot of love and care. We have this beautiful Avalokiteshvara artwork. We have... Uh, good yoga mats, manduka mats. <laughs> <laughs> Better than our shala. <laughs> and we have heating, which is really handy yeah. in, the, in the winter because Kathmandu can get cold. So uh, it's a rather small studio, which, uh, you know, gives me the chance to work with a limited uh, group of students. And, and I like that to really take people far into, the, in, into their practice. If they come to stay with me for a month or so, mm. they can really learn a lot. So do you mm. th then teach them Mysore style or Ashtanga only, or do you also expand that to philosophical teachings? For now, I've been doing only uh, Ashtanga, but we always hang out <laughs> together after class, which yogis usually do. We always hang out and discuss philosophy and our different cultures, because we meet so many different, we are so many different cultures meeting, like we have the Newars, the local, uh, the local Newar people from Nepal, and we have the Indian people coming, we had people coming from Bangladesh, we have Chinese people. Uh, Kathmandu is such a meeting point. So we always end up hanging out together and discussing like philosophy and what our background is. So I haven't been including philosophy in the program, but there is a demand from the students. So I think I will do it. I think I will create uh, for the future a little more in-depth uh, program. That's nice. Mm -hmm. That's nice. So before you came uh, to Purple Valley or before we met for the first time, I uh, read some of your blog posts in, 
on this website, which name I do not remember, and I saw... Super Soul. Super Soul, exactly. Mm -hmm. A really nice website that, mm -hmm. that I can recommend. Many different teachers that are yes. writing, and yeah. some really good writings there. And um, I saw that some of the retreats that you are offering are actually uh, this kind of retreats that I would really like to join, mm -hmm. uh, where you are traveling through mm -hmm. Nepal. We yeah. are walking through Nepal. Can you just no, we are we are traveling. Yeah, traveling. So this so is can a, you tell me a little bit more about those retreats? Also? Yeah. So so this is the thing I really love to do. It's a yoga journey through mm -hmm. the Kathmandu Valley. So we go to uh, certain sacred places and we practice yoga there. We have like three, four different uh, locations. We stay a couple of nights or or three nights um, in each location. So it's a it's a ten day journey so far. So I find it really, it makes sense, it makes a lot of sense to me to go to a monastery and then explain the life there, then explain the philosophy and people are able to go and sit with the monks in the morning and, and really get a feeling for, for what, uh, what the spiritual life is, is like. And uh, we go to other uh, pilgrim sites so uh, it's a chance to uh, it's a chance to see your own yoga practice in the in the context of uh, of other uh, practices really. Uh, so I think um, Nepal is is really the land of uh, yogis. It's where you still find these people who are like uh, shramanas and or people who are in uh, in monasteries. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of monasteries in Nepal actually. Um, and uh, the original culture, the Navari culture, is um, is maybe perhaps I think Nepal today is like India was in the in the old days. Mm -hmm. So we tend to think of India in terms of what it looks like today when it's all like Hindu. But actually, if we go back in history, Buddhism was all over, Jainism was there. So there were all these different uh, religions that were practiced side by side, and there was no conflict. So that's very much the, what you see in uh, Nepal. So you will go to a Buddhist monastery and you will find a little uh, Ganesh Shiva shrine somewhere there. And uh, you, will see, you will often see that there are pilgrim sites where the Hindus will come and they will, uh, and they will uh, worship Kali. And the Tibetans will come and they will worship uh, Vajrayogini in the, in the same place. So uh, it's really an interesting window into what um, uh, what the Indian culture might have uh, have looked like. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. I would love to go for one of those uh, <laughs> yeah, you're trips. Most welcome. Really, yeah. And are you coming back to India now to study ever? Uh, I don't have that in my in my plans to go to Mysore. You mm -hmm. mean? Um, I would like to go, but uh, I have some uh, I have some physical issues with my uh, with my shoulders yes. that I need to take care of first. So I don't think I could do very much in uh, in Mysore at the moment. No, no, no. But uh, I've always liked to go to to Mysore. I, it, it's a beautiful place, and uh, it's also close to my old uh, <laughs> monastery yes. in uh, in Balakuppe. So yeah, I would like to go. So now you are mentioning your shoulder injury. So how uh -huh. does that change your practice now, the Mysore practice? Or not the Mysore practice, but mm. the Ashtanga practice? Well, there's not much you can do without shoulders <laughs> in Ashtanga. Mm. So, you know, it, it changes my perspective on things. Because I was convinced that I would uh, do uh, everything in Ashtanga until I was 85. But as we contemplate in Buddhism, we contemplate impermanence. So impermanence suddenly struck me and I wasn't able to do anything. So um, I, I, still have to, I still have to practice, but I have to do alternative practices. So I just try to find something that can get me into a certain kind of flow, a feeling of flow that, and, bre and breath that we have in Ashtanga. But I have to go easy on the shoulders. So there is a time to heal. And emotionally, did that affect you when you noticed that you could not do your physical practice yeah, today. Yeah, it was so frustrating. Yeah. It was so frustrating. If I at first, if I couldn't do my physical practice, I didn't want to do anything. I wanted to sit down and look, watch Netflix. You know, I didn't. I didn't feel like doing anything else if I couldn't do a shtanga. But as always, you know, people come and and they save you. They say, ah, well, you can do this. And uh, one of my students was a. Uh, 
Uh, she was a personal trainer. She gave me some workouts I could do. So I thought, whew, this is challenging. We really never work our legs and butts and abs. Well, abs we work, but uh, there are things we don't do in the Shanga also. So there are still things you could do. Still time to work on my back bends <laughs> that I can do. They were not never that good, so I can still work on that. So we have to just find alternatives and do what we can do. Because as Ashtanga practitioners, at times we can be very emotionally attached mm -hmm. to the physical practice. Mm -hmm. And through the injury, did you notice that you had like an emotional attachment to the physical practice? Oh, definitely. Ashtanga? Yeah, definitely. I was very attached to my uh, to my Ashtanga practice. But when I think back, I was also very attached to my dance practice. Dance practice. I ne I thought I would never stop dancing, and one day I just stopped. I did Ashtanga mm -hmm. instead, and fine. I'm fine with it. So I guess it's the same with Ashtanga. I guess it's a time for everything. And um, now it's really the time for me to also get more into the other limbs of yoga, into meditation, study more uh, philosophy. But I think I will always love moving because it's such an access point for, for uh, everything else. And kind of access the mind as well through, through the body. Yeah, because I could really feel in your um uh, philosophy classes that you basically that you went much deeper into the philosophy that the mm -hmm. majority of the teachers are doing at Purple yeah. Valley and yeah. it was really nice. I like to challenge people a lot. It's, it's like nice. yeah, Ashtanga for the mind. Yes. You have to put things, you have to stand upside down in your mind and see things from different angles. So it's hard to grasp at first but um, I try to always repeat again and again so you get into a certain way of, of thinking. And uh, yeah, I like to throw people a bit out on the deep water. We have to do, because all we can ever see is our own concepts. So we have to throw people uh, out on deep water to kind of tear the carpet out under their feet. Yeah, 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 yeah. The good thing is that uh, Ellen will be coming back to Purple Valley next season. And we are, I am very much looking forward to that because I hope that uh, the conditions will be slightly different, so I can join more classes in the afternoon. And, and I hope my shoulders yeah, will be fine. And enjoy some more of the Buddhist teaching. Mm -hmm. uh, we have yet not decided the date, so stay, stay tuned for that. So, uh, yeah, I think that's all for this time. I think so. Yeah? Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.